I'm for the government, and I'm here to help you. That's just a joke. The Great Depression, the government was viewed as a savior, saving and saving private industry as well. After this recession, when business, I would argue, brought us to the brink and government saved us, the political response was less government. Now why is that relevant? And why does this lead fairly quickly to a question? It's relevant because I, I was sitting, waiting, you know, at the beginning of Mike's speech, that's a beautiful speech, I was, what is he gonna say about the Americans who are left out? What is he gonna say about the, you know, that large swath of people who seem to be, have been, feel they've been abandoned? Well, he said a lot about it. He said all the right things. But that costs money. It's more than a couple of billion dollars a year, which is sort of the peak of trade adjustment. And he's absolutely right that it's not just trade. It's, it's a broad question of how people who are disadvantaged by both trade and even more by technological change can move. And I mean, some of us have written about this from time to time and suggested we, well, if we're gaining a, billion dollar, a trillion dollars a year in the US economy from trade, maybe and 20 billion is not too much to spend for that. Well, you know, we could say we're spending that in some respects because we do have unemployment insurance and various programs, but they're desperately needed to be restored. How do you get, I guess my question is, how do you get political focus and political energy beyond this, in these types of programs at a time when government per se is viewed as the problem and not the solution? So, I, great, great question. And I'd say, let me give you two answers. One is, and the reason I spent so much time talking about it this morning, is that it's going to be a much bigger problem going forward than it's ever been in the past because of technology change and the pace of technology change. And as a result, I don't think this is about how to build support for trade agreements or for trade agreements alone. It's about how do you maintain social stability and a social compact by making sure that people understand with the rapid pace of technological change that they have an opportunity still to succeed. The second point I would make is it's, it's not necessarily uh, an issue just for the federal government. It's an issue for companies who are thinking about training programs. You know, I, I commend you to, to Tom Friedman's uh, latest book and he has a, a section there that talks about AT&T and how AT&T tells its employees every year what direction it's going in and what businesses may be at risk, but also then lays out what kind of training programs they're gonna make available to their employees. Not government programs, but company programs to make sure that they're skilled for the jobs that are coming online. So this has gotta be, I think, a whole of society effort. So what role do the unions play as they think about their future? Uh, what role do civil society and nonprofit organizations play? There's a lot of experimentation going on at the state and local level that are very effective. So I, I think there is a question of how much resources being put into this generally in our society. I think it's going to need to be a lot more <laughs> going forward than it's been in the past, but it's not necessarily all about how to build new large federal programs. The things that can be done at the federal level, the things that can be done elsewhere as well. Right here. Thank you, Stephen Landry, Manchester Trade. Let me limit myself to two questions because that's why we're here to hear you and then us. Uh, one, USDR has put together an unbelievable professional level number of negotiators in terms of effectiveness, as you said. There's no question that when we negotiate FTAs, other countries have 10, 12% duties. We have two, we get them both down to zero, we get new rules of the road and so on. Does the new administration, based on your conversation, realize what they are doing, appointing what appears to me to be four trade negotiators, talking about moving it around and so on, and they may undermine a very solid professional core of trade negotiators who follow the rules? Second quick question. Uh, the, the second quick question is, what do you think of the use of government power to kind of push, kind of push uh, access and push U.S. goals? Until now, we negotiate great agreements. We then have Tim Wright and others enforce those agreements. Reagan, uh, Reagan uh, Trump has added a new addition saying, I will be the bully pulpit, and I'm going to make sure that we gain from these agreements. Thank you.
Thank you very much for a beautiful five, six years you've been there. Well, I think, uh, uh, I don't have any great insights into the incoming uh, administration, um, other than to say, so uh, maybe uh, the, the nominee for USTR, uh, Bob Lighthizer, has been the deputy USTR. He's got a strong appreciation for the institution, uh, for its culture, for the value of its uh, of its career staff, and I think that's a very positive. Uh, I think that's a very positive thing. Um, you know, look, I think I, I think we all, every, I think every administration, including every president, uses the bully pulpit to try and make sure that things get done that are, are in the U.S. interests. And you know, whether it was uh, President Obama advocating on behalf of individual companies who were up for major procurements abroad, and he was very happy and, and uh, very eager to do so, whether it was for uh, airplanes or construction equipment or infrastructure projects or defense projects, um, or the work that we've done, uh, uh, not just the President, but uh, Secretary Pritzker and others, Select USA, to use the bully pulpit to encourage investment in our work, and it's been tremendously successful. Um, and I, I think uh, that's, a, that's an appropriate role uh, for administrations and for presidents to play, to do whatever they can to help promote interests. Other countries certainly do the same. They were often up against the French or the, the British or the or, or German uh, economic statecraft at the highest levels, and it's going to be important for, for a president to do that also. Thank you. There was some criticism of the negotiations taking place and being too much in secret, and that that was causing all sorts of issues with uh, uh, fear of, of trade. And then later on, there were some suggestions that, uh, uh, that the talks went too far down the road towards the election, that they should have been concluded earlier. If you had it to do over again, or if you were to, to advise the next USTR, is there anything that you would do differently? So that was one of the questions I was going to ask. That's yeah. a great question. <laughs> so anything else? I'm sure the answer is yes. I can go on for hours. Uh, well, look, I, I think I think the, the challenge of these negotiations, uh, whatever they are, is that I, I, I always viewed that our mandate, our job, was to come back with the best agreement for U.S. interests. And the question was how best to do that. And I, I, I can think of lots of examples where we were talking to countries about very sensitive issues. Issues that were sensitive in their political environment. And had it all be done through the press, we would have gotten a, a less good outcome. But we were able to have quiet conversations, have discreet conversations and negotiations, come up with a good solution. And then, of course, it's out there. It's out there for months, for years, for people to look at, shoot at, pick at, and, and in public. So when we completed the TPP on, I think it was October 4th of 2015, one month later, it was all in the net. The entire agreement, every chapter, every side letter, every every uh, uh, schedule was there for everyone to pull apart. And we spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill and with stakeholders uh, and with the public going through it in, in great detail. Um, and we put it out. We put out summaries of every chapter. We put out, if the summaries were too long, we put out fact sheets on every issue. So we tried to bring as much transparency to it as possible, while at the same time making sure that the first goal, which is to come up with the best agreement and possible for U.S. interests, that that was being pursued. Have you done it earlier? I mean, have you been able to reach an agreement earlier? I, I, I would have loved to reach an agreement earlier. If, if the other 11 countries uh, conceded earlier, we would have been done earlier. Uh, <laughs> look, part of, part of the challenge is, uh, part of the challenge is, you know, if you take TPP, it was a very complex agreement. You had 12 countries developed and developing. You had not only the traditional issues of most trade agreements, but we were trying to take on new issues like putting disciplines on state owned enterprises, creating rules for the digital uh, economy, uh, raising labor and environmental standards higher than they'd ever been in any previous agreement. This was not an agreement where eight countries agreed on everything. It was just a matter of bringing the other four countries over the line. There was something like, and Barbara can correct me, there was something like, I'd estimate, a thousand issues, a thousand significant issues that needed to be resolved in the negotiation. And each one of those required building a consensus 
And sometimes Japan was on our side, and sometimes Japan was the problem. And I could say that about each one of the countries. And so it had to be cajoling and convincing and being creative and finding consensus on every one of a thousand significant uh, issues, one by one. There are a lot of it times, you know, when people say, oh, you, uh, you, you didn't have the votes for CPP. I always think about the fact there were hundreds of issues where initially the vote was 11 to 1 against us. And we never threw up our arms and said, we didn't have the votes. It's time to move on. You rolled up your sleeves, you got to work, you worked with other countries, you found creative solutions, you put some elbow grease into it, and at the end of the day, it was 12 to 0 consensus every time. And that's what this negotiation was about. But it was a multi-dimensional chess game. We had 12 countries, 1,000 issues, 30 chapters. That's why it took five years. Now, five years, ironically, in, as you all know, in the trade community, um, is not all that long, um, believe it or not. But it, it took five intensive years. Now, uh, some people say it went on for eight years, 10 years, 23 years, if you ask Tim Grosser. Uh, uh, everyone has a different time. I, I count it as five years of intensive negotiations. And you know, what the team at, at, at USTR and the interagency team that was part of that did to keep that moving forward was simply amazing. Speaking of votes, do you think you had your votes to uh, get this to Congress this year if it got fixed the hill? You know, I, uh, I spent the months leading up to the election at the direction of the Republican leadership. I moved <laughs> nearly 100 House Republican members individually. And virtually all those meetings were very positive in terms of their support. They literally, they had, except for two or three, virtually all of those members were convinced of the merits of TPP, and they were looking to their leadership to find a way to bring it up uh, at, the appropriate, uh, at the appropriate time. So, you know, I, I, I can get very granular of 191 Republicans and 28 Democrats that supported TPA and who we would lose, who we could pick up, <laughs> and the rest. But yes, I think with, with leadership and with the support of congressional leadership and the kind of whip operation, I mean, you never have the votes until you call the question and you mobilize the whip operation. And, but once you do, and you have a good substantive foundation of support, which there was, I think you could have done that. Over here. Barbara Bowie Whitman, I'm with, with Forest Consulting. 28 years ago, I wrote a doctoral dissertation which talked about the influence of our own fiscal policy on the composition of what we export. Now, today, I've had some concerns about what the party I've supported all my life might be doing as they come into office because I've worked for free trade all and 28 years ago, I could see that the way we tax our own capital makes us less competitive in capital-intensive exports. But there's a new concept being floated right now, which says, well, there's not much we can do on tariffs because our tariffs are already so low. Let's get into border-adjusted tax. To me, this is something I haven't even fully explored in my own mind, although I've been a student of this all my life. I don't know if you have thoughts on it, but I'd like to hear if you do. I think there are a lot of ideas being, uh, uh, being floated around, and so I think a lot depends on um, what ideas ultimately, uh, what ideas ultimately uh, pursue. Um, uh, but I think the challenge is if the system put in place is inherently discriminatory against imports. It affects consumers, it affects businesses that <coughs> rely on imports as inputs into their manufacturing process. And, and it will be seen as discriminatory by, by other countries. So I think a lot depends on the design of it and what direction they take it in. But I think at this point, I, I've, I've seen proposals from Capitol Hill, we've seen uh, uh, some discussion from the incoming administration that we have to wait and see what it is they actually decide to pursue. Back here, yeah. Hi, Brett, excuse me, Brett Porter from Inside US Trade. You mentioned that um, a lot of the TPP countries are
they're going through their domestic procedures to ratify the agreement in hopes that the U.S. either um, eventually comes back or they'll implement it themselves. Um, looking ahead, what do you see as the most likely scenario? Is it that TPP happens with 11 countries or that the U.S. You know, goes after a bilateral agreement that builds into something that resembles TPP or that the Trump administration does look at the agreement and decide to move forward with it? I think it's a really good question for the next administration. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really predict myself. I think you have to, I think they, yeah, we have to I think, give them time and space to go through whatever policy process they're going to go through as they learn about what's actually been done um, and then see where they take it from there. What do you think the 11 other countries would uh, most likely do? You know these well, the, other, the 11 other countries would very much, very much want the U.S. to be part of this. That them moving ahead without us is, is not to uh, spurn us. It's to encourage us to also join. But they see the value in the standards that have been negotiated, in the market access that they will then enjoy, which we may not have the privilege of enjoying. And I think that's their, their reason for, for, for wanting to move in. And as I mentioned before, they are also, many of them are using it as a tool for helping to encourage uh, domestic reforms. Mike, we're also negotiating with 28 other countries in Europe, and that negotiation is not as far along as TPP. Obviously, it's not done. Uh, but it was going to be one of the signature accomplishments of the, of, uh, the Obama administration if it, if it had gotten done, and certainly a historic agreement. Um, if you were going to be the USTR going forward, Bearing in mind that there's the Brexit negotiations that are going on at the Europeans, there are at least three, maybe four major national elections next year in Europe. How would you have proceeded to do with the TTIP negotiation in that environment, based on what you know were some of the frustrations that kept us from actually getting a deal before uh, the end of this year? Well, so first, I think, um, uh, I don't think it's been widely discussed, so I'll share some information, but I'm sure I won't keep it just in the room. Um, uh, yeah, at, at the end of the summer, we put together a proposal for a final agreement. And it would have addressed Europe's interests uh, as well as our interests. And uh, when the Europeans returned from, from their vacation, uh, we, uh, we uh, discussed how we can move forward. So, you know, we can move on A, B, and C that are important to Europe and sensitive for us. If Europe can move forward on X, Y, and Z. And it became clear, you know, for a number of reasons, and I'll come back to your question in a second, that Europe could not talk about the most sensitive agricultural market access questions, could not talk about uh, the digital economy, could not talk about various services. And that made it impossible to reach an ambitious agreement this year. This was long before the election. Um, and when the trade, EU trade ministers got together at the end of September, they made it clear there was not going to be an um, ambitious, comprehensive agreement this year. I think that's just the reality of the politics in, in Europe uh, at the moment. Um, they're also focused on getting seated done. They didn't want to do anything that might uh, raise the tension in the member states around TPIP at the same time. Um, and that's, you know, that's where we are, our victim, I think, of somewhat of, of timing and politics. I think given the fact that they've got elections coming up in, in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany um, next year, they've got the Brexit negotiations, there still is pressure on the agricultural um, sector, they've not yet come up with a policy on, on the digital economy. Um, this may still take some time before they are ready to sit down and have a conversation about the issues. I think. The, the interesting part of that process is, as we were going through over the course of the summer, all the chapters, it was the traditional issues like agriculture uh, that were not moving forward. Where we did see progress were on the issues that were particular to TTIP, the talk, work on uh, regulatory practices, on standards. And there's still work to be done in all these areas, but we did make some significant progress in all those areas. So I do hope that at the end of the day, uh, the 
next administration, in your opinion, will be able to pick up where we where we left off and move forward on, on the remaining issues. We're going to do a lot to make progress on those, to identify what the bid ask was on uh, the outstanding issues, and when the politics permit in both countries. I think there is a pathway forward for something that could be quite, quite meaningful.